Hiya! Welcome to this, my 29th episode of Video Fuzzy. I'm your host, Terry J. Amon, and in this installment, titled A Deep Dive to the Inside, I take my deepest dive yet with the Fox profiler thriller The Inside. I share some insights from The Colbert Report and Rescue Me. I scroll through some joke credits from Samantha Bee in my current collection and in what I've been watching. Plays, shows, movies, corrections, and as of this week, this podcast has been live for one year, so I'll be celebrating my one year anniversary special. Welcome to the show. He doesn't have that on video, does he? We'll find out together on video for see you. In 2005, Fox premiered a dark profiler series called The Inside, which I was able to archive to disc 30 in my collection, very near the beginning of this archiving process. A best guess, probably 11 years ago now. Friday Night Feature a team of FBI investigators in Los Angeles is called to a demolition site where a woman is found whose wounds match the signature for a serial killer who has already struck eight times. Number nine, they are horrified to discover, is actually their team member, Margaret Alvarez. Within not much time at all, actually, Margaret's body is still in the morgue, post-mortem pending, and her ex still hasn't arrived to clear out her desk. Her replacement arrives, Rachel Nichols, as Special Agent Rebecca Locke, a data analyst from D.C., fragile, damaged, mysterious. Her application to the profiler program at Quantico denied twice, despite outstanding scores. She is transferred to L.A., and somehow this highly specialized team is her first assignment. Suspicious and owly at first, as the team gets to know her, they come to respect her insights and predictions, especially once Locke determines that Alvarez had actually gone off her meds and committed suicide as a copycat of the serial killer so as to flush him out, and the team determines that this is, in fact, what happened. Locke was handpicked by Peter Coyote as uh, Virgil Webb Webster, their boss, something of freewheeling autocrat within his own division uh, with his own methods and priorities investigating crimes. Jay Harrington, as Special Agent Paul Ryan, doesn't trust Webb, says he only brings in agents whose skills he can exploit. Agent Locke asks him what Webb needs him for. He says, a conscience. For their part, Katie Finneran and Adam Baldwin, as special agents Melody Sims and Danny Love, can't find any background on Agent Locke prior to her FBI training. Agent Ryan digs deeper and finds her restricted files, which reveal a name change. As a child, she'd been taken by a serial abductor called the Pony Man, who appears to her in hallucinations, laying in some darkness and motivation for this beautiful and mysterious young agent. Webb and Locke meet at the scene of the latest victim and discuss what insights she's gained on her current case when they discover something very new, a monitor displaying live video of the killer's latest abduction, matching the profile of a young woman new in town whom the killer wants to depersonalize through the removal of her hands and face to tell the world that she's no one. The team tracks the video to its source and discover that it's in fact a delayed feed, that the killer has already murdered her. This is probably where the investigation should have focused in on the video, recording, transmission, and uh, display equipment, all of which would have had serial numbers traceable to sources, and it's possible all of this was even happening off-screen. But the investigation shifted instantly to sending Rebecca out as bait, out into the subway system, where they find and arrest the killer's mentally ill Patsy, and Rebecca is loudly fired for insubordination. At this point, the real killer, a member of the crime scene in investigative squad, the video tech, hops into the subway car Rebecca is in and confronts her about her pointlessness, her uselessness, how she's really a nobody, how she's been fired and no one will ever be looking for her when, bam, it is revealed that Webb was playing a trick on him, that Rebecca is still being bait, and now they've caught the real killer. I'll start with the notion that it's probably easier to get away with crimes if you're a member of the team investigating them, which is why I always thought Dexter was such an intriguing idea for a show and for a character. No wonder this new girl in town serial killer was able to strike eight times, or as Rebecca said, at least eight times, and so frustrating that Alvarez was willing to kill herself in, in the effort of calling him out. Uh, <clears throat> that's pretty damn committed on her part, to committing suicide with no drugs in her system even to dull the pain from slicing off her own face. I mean, yeah, this show got pretty intense. But it flies in the face of 
well, this is the FBI. I mean, people undergo psych exams, real ones that keep agents who, say, maybe shouldn't be profiling serial killers from doing that. Webb overrode that protocol in Rebecca's case, but Ryan's concern that she'll be too close to these cases is valid, particularly when in the presence of murderous violence, Special Agent Locke suffers both a hallucination and a fainting spell. As the series progresses, we learn more about her. We learn that she sublimated her past experiences enough to function, but retains sufficient access to them to provide dark, troubling insights other investigators can't. We also learn more and more about the darkness in Webb's soul, and, if memory serves, before the series went off the air, about his own rage and inner demons. His team is conflicted about him, but remain fiercely loyal, part of the compelling interpersonal dynamics the production team brought to life in this series. The in Inside, joined the creative efforts of Tim Minear, Richard Hatem, and uh, Jane Espenson, who have laid layers of dark, gritty, atmospheric, character-driven energy into an environment that combined jangly interactions with suspicion and mistrust to drive a crime procedural that vanished from the TV landscape halfway through its run. I found seven episodes of this series in my archive. Uh, seven episodes aired where IMDb lists 13 episodes altogether. This sort of thing was happening to lots of small projects with cult followings at the time. Uh, they'd come up with edgy new sci-fi or speculative series starring hot genre actors. They'd air a few episodes, get us into it, get us obsessing about it online, get us all excited, and then yoink, they'd cancel the series. And whereas I was able to track down DVD sets for Point Pleasant featuring Elizabeth Harnoy's and Grant's show and Tim Minear's Miracles, if Fox released a DVD set for The Inside at any point, they are actively denying it. It would appear that there are no copies of this series to be found anywhere, at least not in any standard online distributor I can identify. If it exists, it may have suffered the same fate as all of those Atari ET game cartridges dumped in a landfill instead of recycled or at least reprogrammed with some different, more commercially viable game. All the same, I'm glad I pulled this up for this week's feature. I enjoyed the show, I enjoyed this premiere, and after some digging, I found where I can actually watch the rest of these on YouTube. Uh, apparently, a Fox affiliate in Chicago aired them, and someone managed to record and post the entire series. I may well take advantage of that option at some point. While I've soured on profilers in recent years, the writing and characters combine to make this one worth tracking down. Diving into the classic collection. In my classic VHS to DVD collection, I found quite a few cool shows, including the third season finale of Rescue Me, in which Sheila drugs Tommy with a combination of roofies and Viagra, mounts and rides him like he slapped her mother, then accidentally sets her new beachfront home on fire. And in Dead Like Me, George is coming to grips with the afterlife, but not before a boneheaded attempt to avert one reap's fate results in dozens of unanticipated and unreaped dead bodies piled up in the Waffle House. Me, I blame recruitment and training on this. If more time was spent explaining to George how toilet seat death from the sky was part of a plan, I even just string a lot of words together to make it sound legit, and how it's better for everyone if she just follows fate's directives as directed, then she wouldn't make so many stubbornly pig-headed rookie mistakes, and... Yeah, the show wouldn't be nearly as much fun, I get that, but since Rube gets stuck with the consequences of her terrible mistakes, you'd think that along with the what, he'd want to include a few extra minutes with her on why. A fifth season monk in this set, Disc 505, finds our defective detective hanging out his shingle as a private investigator and taking on one of the most heart-to-heart -heart style cases that ever there were before. Oh, wait, there's a season two monk in my collection, Mr. Monk Goes to the Ball Game. I have less than a minute of that one on Disc 386, but that scene could actually cut directly to Robert Wagner in a bathrobe with a brandy snifter and Stephanie Powers walking in with his slippers and Lionel Stander in a voiceover with, what did I tell ya? Hi, oh, some of the writing on Monk. It was Moida. I was actually considering an episode of Eureka to highlight for the Friday Night feature this week, uh, an episode where a character bounced around erasing everyone's short-term memories, but somehow did not feel sufficiently epic to anchor an anniversary installment. 
There was an even more ephemeral entry, though, in which Stephen Colbert encouraged his viewers to log in at Wikipedia and report that the number of African elephants had tripled in the past six months. Uh, in July of 2006, he was exploring the notion that if enough people reported a fact on the website Wikipedia, it became reality, coining the phrase wikiality, or reality as presented by Wikipedia. Now, any crowdsourced compendium will have at least a qualified relationship with reality, so while today it's a reasonably moderated source, it's necessary to at least say when you've relied upon it for any information at all. That said, in times such as these, when news that disagrees with one's biases, preferences, wishes, and or expectations is dismissed as fake, one is hesitant to base claims on any one source for much of anything, such as that fool host of video fuzzy... Error, error, error. Bow down, lift hearts, raise forth the house of abundance. How dare, how dare you cast aspersions against my child candy? I do not care if all the photos on that what pray tell is an IMDB look exactly like her. This child, my child, candy, did not walk off, did not desert, did not sashay away from her mother, mother elect of the house of abundance. That was that ashen faced side eye. I will not hear any speak against her. She is a hot mess, but she is my mess, Miss Blanca. She has spit in my face, her mother's face, with this flash in a pantsuit house of evangelista, and I love her as I love all my children, but my love is measured in discipline. So long as she presents, she is my heart, she is my child. You will not disrespect her, you will say her name, you will get it right. She is herself, Miss Thing, Miss Blanca, carte blanche, Casablanca of the house of evangelista, and when you speak of her, you will come correct. Am I understood? Loud and clear, Mother Abundance. I tell you, I was mortified when I pulled up last week's episode of Pose and heard principal character MJ Rodriguez referred to as Blanca. In episode 28, when I wrote my reaction to Ryan Murphy's 1980s exploration of the lives of drag performers in New York, I could not remember what her name was. And despite this having bit me square in the butt before, I pulled up the cast list on IMDb, consulted the tiny thumbnails to discover her name, and no... She does not have a photo loaded there, and yes, the photos are small, but I confused her for Angelica Ross as Candy and misidentified her six times in my beat poetry submission. <laughs> Despite the fact that I fixed the error and re-uploaded the episode the moment I could, and limited though the initial download may well have been, the fact that I made such an egregious error in reviewing such an identity-affirming show in which clearly... Quite a lot of energy and effort has been expended in establishing authenticity, no less so than setting as a stated priority the casting of transgendered actors in lead and supporting roles. I was eager to fix my error within the limitations of my editing software and to make it right to what extent I could with this correction here. I'm aware of a few other errors in recent episodes. Those will keep for my next slate of corrections set for episode 35, and from here on out, if I am in doubt, I will double-check my recording. Word. <sighs> Current Collection in my current direct-to-DVD recordings, I have been making some excellent progress. I nearly caught up with what I've been watching, actually within just a couple of discs at this point. I've cataloged through disc X-155, and I'm currently recording to disc X-158, so I'm pretty excited to be closing in on that. This set of discs, in fact, I've spoken about so recently in recent What I've Been Watching segments that there's little point in line-by-lining discs X148 through discs 155, but to pull out a couple of highlights, I'll mention that I've cataloged most of season 1 mermaid drama Siren off of Freeform, which claims to have a second season, but as I continue to watch it, season 1 will probably be it for me. Also, I got the first season of Taboo, which, to clarify, did air on FX, not FXX, so that was cool. Uh, there's some suggestion it may return for a second season later this year, but I'm not sure I'll be along for that ride. I mean, it's hardly uninteresting, but it's not that compelling either. If I'm through with Supernatural and Breaking Bad by the time it returns, if it returns, I, I may give it a chance. 
I also caught the season 8 finale of Bob's Burgers and this odd juxtaposition between an advocacy group pressuring viewers to call North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp to urge her to support the CIA directorship of Gina Haspel and a KX News report confirming that Senator Heitkamp had indeed thrown her support behind Gina Haspel. Uh, no real comment here. I mean, she's representing a very red state and has to dance with them what brung her, but it's weird to watch an ad calling for something in one moment and then so directly on its heels to see a news report where that very thing happens in the next. Uh, Stephen Colbert has had some cool musical guests recently, including Paramore singing Rose Colored Boy, Nathan Rateliff and the Night Sweats with You Worry Me, Liam Payne and Jay Balvin's What Seemed to Be Jockeying for the Song of the Summer Familiar, and oh wow, I loved the energy in Lake Street Dive's performance of Good Kisser. Most fun, potentially, I found on Disc X148, a fully produced tribute to Sarah Huckabee Sanders on Full Frontal with Samantha B, opening with a title sequence featuring not especially feminist statements from such luminaries as Phyllis Schlafly and Ann Coulter and, oh, this was fun, Anita Bryant getting schmucked in the face with a pie, all in golden sepia historic tones over rousing strings with the title The Great Feminists and Feminism Herstory Hall of Lady Fame, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. After all of that, host Samantha B. took the stage and said, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is an effin' liar. <laughs> Good night, everyone! She cabaret waved herself out a shot, and the credits shot up the screen over those same super feminist images we had just seen, uh, just about a million miles an hour. Well, that's always an invitation for me to pull out the frame advance feature on my DVD player, so I paused the segment and, for everyone who looked away for a moment and missed it, and, with full writing credits to Samantha Bee and her staff, here are the credits listed for Full Frontal with Samantha Bee's segment, The Great Feminists and Feminism Herstory Hall of Lady Fame, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. They are executive producer Samantha B, head writer Melinda Taub, best boy Corey Bishop, boss baby Cassidy Ruth, Lord of Cannons Corey Palmer, fish handler Lauren Walker, motorcycle technician Andy Kopp, uh, junior coordinator Pat King, tufted warbler Dan Spencer Levine, credits Ed Mundy, Ed Mundy Ben Mendelwitz, lead singer Mike Hubens, legume expert Paul Myers, ICE Nathan Erhart, shadow warrior Carolyn Shaper, head parkour Daniela Philipson, gentleman grifter Anna Breton, senior Rachel Rachel Severno, Associate Bond villain Michael Ruda, Grill Master Colin Jakubsik, Ring Bear Nicole Silverberg, Flower Girl Hannah Wright, Junior Rachel Rachel Moss, Justin Kappa Eugene Piculin, Mandatory Edition Ellie Elkin, and the rest Andrew Mendelson, Tennille Weethoff, Julia Fott, Carol Hartzell, Ashley Nicole Black, Jesse Cohen, Jeremy Hardwick, Miles Kahn, Sophie Eisenstall, Julia Levitsky, Noreen Khan, Sanya Dasani, and with special thanks to Allison Camilo. So, that's a thing that happened. Fun! What I've been watching. In what I've been watching, Ralph and I managed a day trip to Minot last weekend to take in the Minot State University Summer Theater production of Sister Act, which I haven't seen the Whoopi Goldberg movie in many years, but I remember it as being quite a lot of fun. Most of what you hear about her these days is his longtime host of The View, but there seemed to be a stretch of time in the 80s and 90s when Whoopi Goldberg kept pretty busy. The Color Purple, Sister Act, Sister Act 2, Ghost, Jumpin' Jack Flash, and on television she recurred as Guinan in Star Trek The Next Generation, and according to IMDb, her own show that I never saw, uh, playing Mavis Ray on something called Whoopi. In Sister Act, Whoopi Goldberg as Dolores Van Cartier is an aspiring lounge singer who witnesses a mob hit at a nightclub and the cops put her in witness protection as a nun. This tracks similarly to the stage production, a musical, which opens in South Philadelphia in Christmas of 1978 with Take Me to Heaven, uh, one of those we imagine relatively rare songs that is just as at home in a lounge act as a choir loft. Teresa Hargrove sang the lead role of Dolores Van Cartier in a strong voice that held its own among a company of talented singers. Ryan Hyder, as her boyfriend, married mob boss Curtis, isn't interested in her singing in his lounge at the moment, but gives her a deep blue fur for Christmas that seemed to have been meant for his wife. She's going to throw it back in his face, but just then witnesses him whacking one of his underlings, Ernie, who in fact has been informing on him. 
Uh, Dolores takes off and runs to the police, reconnecting with Brian McKinley as old crush Sweaty Eddie, a detective now, putting the case together against Curtis. He needs to keep Dolores alive long enough to testify, and what luck! There's a convent in South Philly in desperate need of a miracle. Numbers are down, and things have been going so badly it's going to be purchased by the gays and turned into an antique shop. Thus, with the promise of a generous donation from the police, Peg Morris, as Mother Superior, grudgingly accepts the care of this wayward sister, agreeing to shelter Dolores in the convent until her court appearance. But Dolores proves a disruptive influence and, among other things, runs out of the convent her first night in search of a cheesesteak sandwich, and a couple of the other nuns follow her, including Shelby Cross as Sister Mary Robert, a postulate, a title which Dolores misunderstands uh, hilariously. Except for how incredibly coincidental the following scene is in all the gin joints in all the world, Curtis's underlings just happen to be in that very bar plotting their strategy for finding Dolores, and while she's standing there in her habit, actually see a drag queen in a blue fur which they mistake for her. Mother Superior is furious that Dolores put her nuns in danger, but puts her to work directing the choir, which needs help. As Dolores brings them in tune in an absolutely fantastic high-energy number, Raise Your Voice, more parishioners are drawn to the church and the church's fortunes start to turn around. In Act 2, the underlings are still trying to find Dolores when a local news segment airs some music from the church that they recognize, and they figure out ways to sneak into the convent with the hilarious seduction attempts outlined in Lady in the Long Black Dress. Mary Robert shines in her number, The Life I Never Led, and as Curtis and his underlings search the convent for Dolores, they are thwarted by standard burlesque shtick. It's fun to watch and solve the problem, not to mention the church's financial woes as well, but oy, the disbelief, you'll need a crane for suspending it. All the same, absolutely enjoyable show, well sung, well presented, beautiful night for it, so glad we were able to take it in. Well done, guys. And this weekend, Ralph took me to The Incredibles 2, a Disney Pixar sequel some 14 years in the making. I loved the stylized production credits at the beginning, the animation of the Disney castle in a red, retro 1950s theme, closing on the window entrance glowing gold with the Incredibles 2 logo, and same for the reimagined Pixar credits. I'll go as spoiler-free as possible that, in a world contrary to our own in which we are bombarded with superhero films left and right, in The Incredibles 2, superheroes are still outlawed, the use of powers is regarded as destructive and counter the public interest, and Oh yeah, I love this one. Politicians don't understand a hero's motivation to do good simply because it's the right thing to do. Nevertheless, the family is pulled back into service battling the Underminer, uh, who robs a bank and dismantles the downtown area, and somehow the Incredibles get the blame, so go into hiding. Meanwhile, a brother and sister research design and marketing team approach them about getting the law changed, allowing superheroes again. In making this attempt, wife and mother Elastigirl becomes the public face of the team, while dad and husband Mr. Incredible stays at home with the kids and tries to help his son with homework and help his daughter with the various emotional traumas of dating, and oh hey, turns out his infant son has many, many powers, which among other things pulls in a fantastic cameo by Brad Bird as Edna Mode. I enjoyed the fight sequences and the villain, and while at two hours I thought it could probably ran a little long for a kid's show, it told a good story with good pacing. Also, there's a character who can open portals, kind of exactly like Doctor Strange, but I think this is the first time I've ever seen that effect from the point of view of the character falling through them, so yeah, if for nothing else, I definitely want to see this again at some point to really examine those scenes, because that seemed like it was both confusing and brilliant. Good move, Incredibles 2. In television, Dietland on AMC. I only caught the pilot episode of this production. I'm not 100% nailed in on the kind of story it is yet. Uh, corporate espionage, a personal empowerment battling body dysmorphia, a, a revolutionary uprising of criminal conspiracy. Um, <laughs> oh, why can't it be all those things? Uh, in Dietland, Joy Nash is Plum Kettle, the writer of an advice column for a magazine geared towards young women seeking to turn them into young wives. The show explores a seamy underworld of which perhaps most of us are simply unaware, in which radicalized vigilantes target abusive men, in which body dysmorphia is elevated to a sacrament, in which underground subversives seek to join forces with hopeless teenage girls, and all of this is just going on around all of us as part of our normal day-to-day -day life. 
I'm intrigued, particularly in that the production staff is helmed by Buffy alum Marty Noxon. That's plenty to recommend this show heading forward, and while I'm still getting my bearings, I'm certainly interested in seeing where she's going with all this. Finally, I caught the second season finale of Legion a couple weeks ago now, and no, the show is not going where I expected it to, and it's absolutely not going where I'd like it to, but all the same, I can't wait for season three, because between trippy, evocative animated battles between David and the Shadow King, confrontations between Sid and David where she rejects his assertion that he's a good guy after watching him torture Oliver, vanquish the Division Three soldiers, and right in front of her attempt to physically crush the skull of Amal Farouk, all with a look of maniacal glee on his face, and with Farouk's then turning the tables on him, possessing his friends and colleagues to trap him and put him on trial, David turns inward, examines his situation, and escapes, taking Lenny with him. As I've said elsewhere, this show is pure art. It plays with ideas and perception. It explores concepts other shows do not, which, while putting it in the rounding error of demographics ratings-wise, makes it an especially interesting show to encounter, and I will follow these characters in this story for as long as FX will let me. I mean, just to highlight as one four- or five-minute burst of joy the scene near the beginning right after the battle between David and Farouk, the scene between Jermaine Clement and Jean Smart as Oliver and Melanie set three years later. They're together in a cryogenic stasis, enjoying their upscale mid-century life of happiness and domestic bliss in Cube Sweet Cube. It's an excellent contrast in energy and perspective, something this show seems to do really well and part of what I love about it. Fare thee well, Legion, and hurry back. And now... Well, that was lovely. That isn't quite how I would... I'd like to speak to your manager. Feedback. Hey, Jerry. Just uh, enjoying video fuzzy with my morning coffee. Uh, congratulations on a year, and here's to another uh, another great year. Um, hello from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you, Billy. Billy Lutzen, everyone. A friend of mine from when I was in Minot. Thanks, and... Oh, hey. Hey there, Terry. This is Mark Bailey, also known as Grail Wolf. And this is Heather Wellover. We're from the Grail Wolf's Geek Life podcast. And hopefully a uh, as-yet-to-be-named successor podcast. Keep your uh, eyes peeled. Ears peeled? Whatever. That sounds painful. Keep them all peeled. Whatever. Anyway, we wanted to say uh, how much we've been loving Video Fuzzy. And congratulations on one, one year. year. That is awesome. That is a heck of a milestone. Congratulations, Terry. Have a great one. And uh, again, happy one year. We love you. <laughs> wow, you guys. Love you both. Love you all so much. Really fun to hear. Yeah, Mark is probably the single greatest inspiration for me to get into podcasting in the first place. Way back in, I think it was probably March of 2009 or so, with new episodes from my podcast, TV is the New Reading, at that time, posting as late as January of 2012. So when I got this current project to that point, it seemed like the perfect opportunity for getting back into it. Yep, for everyone who's made it this far, this episode celebrates one year of Video Fuzzy. This podcast went live a year ago this past week, June 19th, 2017. I am over the moon that it's still going, uh, more or less tracking the goals I set for it, providing me a creative outlet to talk about the media I encounter and to motivate me to keep cataloging a personal media archive stretching back decades, cataloging thousands of homemade DVDs and sharing what I'm finding on these things. To celebrate this milestone, I recorded a video titled Video Fuzzy, the video, and I'll link to it in my show notes and video Fuzzy's Facebook page and my Facebook page and my Twitter account. Uh, seriously, anyone hearing this, anyone wanting to see it, you're going to have no trouble finding it. I wanted to give you all a sense of the space where I do this, my process, my philosophy, my approach, and how I put it together, and since it's kind of a special occasion, I thought I'd dress up a little. You can catch all of that in my anniversary video, Video Fuzzy the Video, on YouTube. Enjoy! And with that, thanks for checking in on my video cataloging project. You can check out my catalog listing along with audio links at videofuzzy.blogspot.com and past episodes of this podcast at Apple Podcasts and iTunes at videofuzzy.libsyn.com. Feedback is always appreciated, and you can contact me through my blog or podcast sites or through my Video Fuzzy page on Facebook, or you can follow me at TJ Video Fuzzy on Twitter. For Video Fuzzy, I'm Terry J. Amon. Happy viewing. It might be amazing. It might just be scuzzy. We'll find out together on Video Fuzzy. Yeah.